What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Culture Views TV. I'm one of your hosts and producers, Jordan Ahisi. Joined by someone that actually survived the submarine, Mo. <laughs> Not someone who survived the submarine. Anywho, thank y'all for popping out and listening to our pod. If you are on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or anywhere where this can be visually streamed, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you're listening to this audibly on you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, be sure to give us a five stars. You already know how that goes. We really, really appreciate the support. Random fact, I got these bracelets. My best friend gave them to me, so y'all going to get a little bit of this bracelet asmr i likes it (laughs) bracelet anyway but yeah thank you so much we're gonna get right oh wait before i even go into that forbidden door this saturday aka tomorrow when this drop no sunday when it drops um so be sure to join us for the space per usual it's gonna be a lot of fun i'll be there uh mo will be there it's gonna be great um but without further ado let's get right into the show so Last Saturday, AEW debuted its new TV program, AEW Saturday Night Collision, emanating live from the United Center in Chicago, Illinois. Obviously, we saw the return of CM Punk. We saw a brand new TNT champion, and we also saw a main event where Bullet Club Gold and Samoa Joe faced off against CM CMFTR um, and in a six-man tag team match. So I wanted to kind of know your first impressions on uh, Collision and how it kind of stacks up against Dynamite. You know, I didn't think they actually overdid it the way my brain conjured. Like, in my head, for some reason, when they were bringing up um, Collision being like an official brand, my brain kind of thought about when uh, Triple H uh, decided to take NXT, well, not Triple H, Vince tried taking NXT and making an actual brand and putting it on TV, and there's a lot of hype. And I felt like they were trying to do a lot on purpose on the first day. Um, but I didn't get that vibe. Um, I felt like it was a pretty like moderate show, but like that that was probably better off that way instead of just overhyping it and then not enough people watch. I felt like what they really wanted to get out there was try to let people know that like this is gonna be punk's turf. Because they kind of start off the show right off with it. I thought they were going to put his message somewhere in the middle so that you could retain viewership. Because, of course, mm. like that was kind of like the incentive to watch it. Yeah. To listen to his message. But they kind of like put it right in the beginning. And then the show kind of went down a little bit up, down a little bit up. But to me, my excitement level was about a regular Wednesday with Dynamite. Not that I'm saying it's a bad thing, but I'm wondering if they were just doing that just because they're just working on Forbidden Door, and then once that gets out the way, then they're going to. But to answer, like, your question about, like, the whole competition between Dynamite and Collision, it was subtle. And you didn't really notice it on Collision, but you noticed it when Punk decided to make a comment saying, like, I'm not even supposed to be here. Like, I'm supposed to be on Collision, (laughs) you know? Like, it's, I like how he's kind of reiterating that, yeah, like, there are going to be two turfs, therefore two rosters or whatnot, um, that I'm on possibly the next A show, <laughs> the next A show. So it could be, but right now I feel like they're going to go about it in a slow crescendo. But what do you think? I think that I kind of, you know, piggybacking off of what you agree, I think that Collision solidified a couple of things, um, that this is the CM Punk show. Um, that he will be kind of the guy spearheading everything as it pertains to the the visual and the aesthetic aspect of this show. What I will commend Tony Khan for is that he has a really good knack for making all of his products feel different in some way, shape, or form. Like, mm-hmm. when I was watching Collision, obviously, I love hearing Kevin Kelly. I love hearing Nigel McGinnis on commentary. Um if you noticed during collision, it wasn't super high flyy. It wasn't too acrobatic. It felt like traditional wrestling for a Saturday night. And it felt like a real true callback to like a WCW Saturday night show. So I thought that that was a very, very interesting choice. I don't think that that was by accident. I think that was by intention. So I think that that was a couple of, like another thing that I noticed um, as it pertains to how it stacks up. I think that this, like you said, I think that they kind of hinted at it subtly when Punk was just like, ah, I'm not even supposed to be here. But I think that there is going to be kind of a very, very big brand distinction between the two. And I think that 
fans are going to enjoy both shows a lot, but I, I love Collision. Like, I love the way that it looks. I love the way that it feels. It feels like an extended version of Rampage. It feels like bell-to-bell action, good wrestling, good promos. It doesn't feel too sports entertainment-y like Dynamite does, if you know, if you get my gist. But, and I think that, like you said, I don't think that they, you know, were intentionally hyping this up or trying to make this a crazy, crazy show because, once again, they have a Forbidden Door coming up and then they're going to start that build to All In. Um, but I do believe that they did a good job of kind of managing expectations. And I think that part of, you know, them being able to successfully manage expectations allowed for some pretty interesting changes and twists during the show. For example, when Luchasaurus won the TNT Championship, I don't think that anybody saw that coming or expected that, but because they didn't like hype up anything, the expectations were kind of moderate and thus anything that was outside of the original expectation that we had for the show was a very, very big, pleasant surprise. Like, oh, wow, Luchasaurus, Luchasaurus is doing that. Um, But yeah, um, that was kind of my opinions on, on Collision. Did you have anything else to to add to that or no i just really like that comparison that you made with the um i guess wednesday being more entertaining and more flippy divey yeah. and then more concrete wrestling on on saturday because I, I didn't think about that until you said it i'm like yeah maybe that's why maybe i don't know maybe that's why i i liked it and i wonder if they did it on purpose if that's the, like the roster they set up on purpose to give you two different variations of wrestling because you do have two different types of viewers that watch wrestling. You do get people that just like love watching pro wrestling because they grew up on the E, so they love like that sports entertainment factor. Right. And they don't really like to see all like the flips and dives because to them, their brains just kind of communicate indie. So I wonder if that was like on purpose or mm. that just happened to be how the show looked like on Saturday. Because if that's his case, I feel like that's very smart to retain viewers. Because then you could kind of, like, maintain, like, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday people. Or if you just like straight up wrestling, I mean, you could just kick it and watch Saturday if you have nothing else to do. But I do feel like I do see competition. Um, I just feel like it has to be, like, a slow brew. Other than that, I think they did a good job with Collision. I agree with you. I think we're going we're gonna to segue on that note. Let us know how y'all felt about Collision. If there was anything that we missed, let us know in the comments below. But we're going to move on because... And an interesting development as WWE continues to build towards their next premium live event, Money in the Bank. An unexpected person is now participating in the men's Money in the Bank ladder match. And that person is social media megastar Logan Paul. Now, I just wanted to know, does this kind of in heighten your interest in the match or the show? Is this a me- is this a needle moving occurrence, if you will? Um. Yeah, honestly. And I feel like it's needed because last year was kind of ass. Like, no, like it was so drastic last year between like the women's and the men's and it was kind of by default because of who won it and the way it was won. I don't remember much of the men's um, money in the bank, which is kind of upsetting because it's like a fun Mm pay-per-view. So I feel like bringing Logan Paul is fun to shake things up, especially since they are already bringing in star power, star power with Tristratus. So I feel like it's a good balance. Because now we really don't know what's going to happen. We also don't know what Logan Paul is capable of. Like, right. we see him do so much of, like, the unexpected. It's just, like, what tricks does he have up his sleeve now for the money in the bank? So I think this is going to be fire. I think it's going to be really fun. Um, and it's going to be nice to see how he operates now with um, multiple people. Because we only see him in a tag team situation and a one-on-one and then we see him of course in the royal rumble but i don't like really count the royal rumble as working with multiple people because technically you normally work with one person or you tag team with someone else or you get jumped by two people now we're gonna see him work with multiple people so it's like really testing his skills mm-hmm. but i like how they're feeding it to him very gradually so i'm very interested in seeing how this is going to play out um but how do you feel about logan paul being in the money in the bank so one of the biggest questions that i had when Logan Paul faced uh, Roman Reigns in Saudi Arabia in that in that championship match was now that he has main evented, now that he has gone against arguably the biggest guy in the company, how can he sustain this momentum while also uh, putting him in a position where he can highlight his strengths? And I don't think that there's any 
environment that is more perfect for him to do both than being in the men's money in the bank ladder match. Number one, international premium live event. So they're pulling out all the stops. They want to make this as big as possible and pulling out easily one of the biggest stars, not just in WWE, but in American media and entertainment. And Logan Paul is an absolute genius move. So that's one. Two, being in there with someone like uh, Santos Escobar and being in there with LA Knight and being in there with Ricochet. These guys are not scrubs. They're great athletes. They're great performers. And they're also guys who, you know, we haven't heard of being unsafe, you know? And so to be, for him to be in there with a guy, with a bunch of guys who are at the top of their game and also safe performers, I think is just going to translate very, very well because not only is, I think that he's going to have a great performance. I think that he's going to be in the, in the ring with guys that are going to make sure that he's good, that he's safe, blase, 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 blase. So I think, and, and then on just on top of that, like to kind of compliment the first point is that because he's one of the biggest stars, this is definitely going to be a draw. This is definitely going to be a needle moving occurrence. I wish we could somehow get Logan and Bad Bunny in there, but I feel like that, I feel like a bad, I feel like, I feel like that would translate better if it, if it was a show in the States versus in London. But I, I am a fan of seeing Logan in the Money in the Bank ladder match. And I think that it is going to make a big difference when all is said and done. You like you was about to say something. No, so I was mad excited to think about Bad Bunny just because, like, after what he pulled in Puerto Rico, like, I feel like this man could do no wrong. So he would, he would eat down a Money in the Bank. It would, like, it would still all the, the charisma away from the women's match if they did though. But if they put the two of them, it'd be almost unfair just because. But I'm actually really excited and I love that it's a different batch of names. Like normally they kind of just like sneak in the same people. I appreciate the fact that we're seeing like a rotation of people in that we're not used to seeing in these type of um, gimmicky matches. So right. I'm expecting a really, really fun pay-per-view. I agree with that, and I'm yeah. very, very excited for, for his appearance. But we want to know what you guys feel like. How are you feeling regarding Logan Paul's um, – matter of fact, before I even go into that, I feel like the interesting part about it is even with Logan Paul being in the match, L.A. Knight is over. Oh, very. <laughs> He's so over. He's so – like, when he got – when he came out on the last episode of, of SmackDown – that was a very stone cold rock like moment for him where he came out adulation of the crowd, his entire, the entire crowd was saying, Oh, a night. Like I love that. And, but he's just super over. I had to get that off my chest. No, it's funny that you say that. Cause he even said like in an interview that he should have been in WWE already like years ago and like it shows and you just made a whole connection to stone cold, which is a huge compliment. Yeah. You know, he has that, he has that energy, that dynamic. So, but we want to hear what you guys feel about Logan Paul being in the Money in the Bank ladder match. But we're going to be moving on because one of the other, easily the biggest development in the WWE is obviously the ever-evolving bloodline storyline. And last episode of SmackDown, Jey Uso has departed uh, from the side of Roman Reigns and Solo Zokoa, and he has joined Jimmy. Uh, and rumors and reports are speculating that we have a bloodline Civil War tag team match that is slated for Money in the Bank in London. How do you just feel about how all of this is unfolding and just the progress of this bloodline storyline? And are you excited for this match at Money in the Bank? First of all, bloodline Civil War is so dramatic, but so, so funny. Dramatic. It's so extra, but it's so <laughs> apropos. <laughs> but it needed an overtop name for such like an over the top storyline. And like I was one of those people that was sleeping on the bloodline in the beginning just because I got tired of seeing Roman with the belts. But like now we're like looking at probably the greatest storyline that's been placed in WWE in like the last decade. And it's actually like getting better. And I want to actually like give kudos to wwe because they're usually not good with like long-term storytelling mm -hmm. but whoever is dealing with this storyline i'm i feel like it has paul Heyman's hands all over it like it, it is being treated with so much care because yeah we knew that the usos were going to depart like we already predicted that like you know around what like, like months ago, like six months ago, at least we, we predicted that it would probably take the Usos leaving or, Co or Cody winning one or the other for 
you know, um, a fraction to happen in the bloodline. But the way that they're going about it is just so good. Like, I honestly don't give, like, I, I know Roman's good at acting because he's had acting roles, but I don't give uh, Jimmy and Jay enough, like, acting credibility. Like, bro, they had my full attention during um, the, the last pay-per-view. It's slipping my mind right now. But it had they had my full attention during the Saudi um, pay-per-view with their acting, and they had it yet again. Yet again, because I'm not going to hold you. Jay, like, had me thinking, oh, shit, he has Stockholm Syndrome. He's going to go back to Rome with that whole setup that he went with, was saying, like, I made a Ben Jay Uso, and it's all because of him. I'm thinking, oh, God damn it. Like, we're going to extend the storyline for, like, another few months with them. And then he just, like, hits you with the, you're out, and I'm out, too, and then, bah. Like, I usually don't pop for a super kick, but I pop crazy for that super kick, son. I pop crazy. Everything was so perfect about it between like their facial reactions, Paul Heyman walling out in the background like a Caribbean mom that just, <laughs> nah, nah, you know how Caribbean moms be stressed out that like, stressed, <laughs> stressed okay. that like, like demons are attacking their kids or something like that. <laughs> like They're calling up from God. That's exactly what Paul Heyman was doing in the background. He was just on his elbows praying and praying. <laughs> And the whole way that they turned on Solo, how how I love how they kept him so strong and how they made it seem like it took two of the Usos together. Like, they had to join as one to, like, overthrow, you know, the, this this big dominant force that is the bloodline. But also, again, like, keeping, like, Solo, like, strong themselves by taking the two of them to knock him out. I'm like, oh, wow, like, there's so many, like, pipelines going on with this. And it's, like, mm -hmm. so juicy. It's so juicy and i never thought of like that being such like a great way to really establish the usos as like being one of the greatest tag teams ever to have been created in wrestling like they made a list back in 2022 over the summer that we went we went, we went over yeah. was it the summer i think it summer was or fall one or the other and like at first i don't think i was really like jacking them being towards the top of the list but like now i'm okay. like you know what they deserve it they could like do everything they really like look what they've given us over just the last year alone. Quality content. I'm so invested into the storyline. Like I could say screw everything on the next pay per view and watch, but honestly, this is a jam packed car that we got going on. But this is juicy. I've never been so excited to be a WWE fan. <laughs> but this storyline has me at like the palm of their hands, bro. Make me making me regret my whole outburst with Cody losing. That's how good it is. And it's supposed to be unpredictable. It's supposed to be. And that's what they're doing perfectly. This whole thing is perfect. And no one going on for a long tangent. So <laughs> take it away, Jordan. How do you feel about this? I was about to say, you, that was not long. But what I will say <laughs> is I feel like part of the, 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 the excitement behind the storyline is I feel like there is a collective implicit agreement that I think like I feel like a lot of people are just like I think we overreacted to Roman going over Cody because now that all this is happening we get it now we get it now yeah the the whole two titles becoming one the title the championship actually becoming gold him kind of still occupying that main event spot it's giving the, the title prestige, even more prestige than it already has. Totally. And because he still has the belt, anything that's attached to him is going to continue to go up in value. So the Usos are going to be on a wave. Solo is going to be on a wave. And then when he goes into whatever season he goes into, defending that title, whoever takes the title off of him is going to get the rub because that's going to be essentially the last piece of the storyline is just that belt. So I think that they have done an incredible job of just maintaining, keeping focus and not letting public opinion sway them. Like in WrestleMania, the, the press conference, Roman Reigns said, we're only in the third inning. And he was not lying because business picked all the way up um, after WrestleMania. And so I think that that is, that's my first point pertaining to it is just how quality the storyline is and just, how well they've been weaving people in and weaving people out and, 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 and raising the value of everyone who comes in contact with the story. I think the next big thing is just 
how, like you said, Jay Uso has had a a standout performance. I some, somebody put up a, a meme of Jay Uso was like nominated for best supporting actor of an Emmy, <laughs> and but like I'm listen. I this is the first time I've ever give them a movie, bro. Them Samoans all need to be in a movie. That. All need to be in a movie. They need to be the next Fast and Furious. Honestly. <laughs> Yo, I, that's crazy. I feel, okay. I feel like if if you were to nominate, um, if you were to nominate um this storyline for um, if you were to nominate this storyline for an Emmy award, not only would I believe you, but I believe that they deserve to win it because it's just so fluid. And it's mostly because of the performances of guys like Jimmy and Jay Uso. I feel like there was always like this argument, not even this argument, but there's always like this thing is like, you can't tell Jay apart from Jimmy. You can't tell. I feel like there is now a very, very, very clear difference in the two. And Jimmy and Jay have gotten their individual spotlights in this story to the point where you can tell both of them apart. And now they both have standalone value. And it gives them so much flexibility going forward because, like, what if Jay wanted to go for a U.S. title? Or what if Jimmy wanted to go for an Intercontinental title? It's believable now because yeah. both of them have been proven to be, have proven to have, you know, successful independent tenures. So I think that that's just another story. But this this storyline is phenomenal. It's the best storyline in the history of WWE, bar none, hands down. Better than Austin McMahon. It just is. What were you going to say? Go ahead. Oh, no, like, the fact that you made, like, the distinction between them, because, like, this was very, like, subtle that they threw into the promo, but mm-hmm. they were talking about how, um, like, I don't think they, uh, Jimmy, I believe, didn't believe that, like, Jay should have been, um, chosen. Mm. I, I'm not sure it was chosen for a belt, but, or chosen just to be in the bloodline first as, like, you know, like a spearhead, yeah. but, like, there was a little bit of static between the two of them because jay's like did you actually say that about me and he said like yeah but he didn't even get a chance to like explain himself why so it's just like little things like that could be used later on like there's so many little again like pipelines going on with Mm -hmm. um the storyline but the main thing that i did want to comment on was just how important the belts feel like I feel like compared to like months ago, well, I don't want to say months ago because Cody coming back actually did make the belts feel like important because, you know, of course you need um, the right contender to right. make a match, a match. But now, but now it's beyond the match. It's like the value that's going into both pieces of gold. And we're going to get into Seth's belt, but focusing on Roman, it's just like the belt is now like literally part of his character. Before people were just complaining saying, yo, he's hogging the belt, he's hogging the belt. And like we were complaining before that like, yo, like Cody should have went over. It was like the right place, the right time. How could you do this to us? You just said fuck the fans, blah, blah, blah. But now we see that since the bloodline is just like dismantling before our eyes, this front of Roman's eyes, it's going to get to a point where he's going to be all alone and he's going to have nothing to hold on to for his ego, but this belt. Yeah. And when he loses it, like he is going to snap. Like we're used to seeing, yeah, we're used to seeing like this very egotistical side of Roman, this very arrogant side of him, you know, like this, no one could take me down. No one is better than me. I'm the tribal chief, you know, all that stuff. But it's like now, like everything like that's about him is like invested into this belt. Like this, this is it. This is all he has left. Mm. Like when he don't have that anymore is going to be devastating, but also very satisfying as a fan for whoever takes that power away from him literally that belt is actually power now it's been like such a long time since a belt had like prestige on its own and it didn't need like just a name to make the belt important of course the storyline is making the belt important but now like whoever takes that from roman they almost kind of like absorb all of his power with it mm. And um, Jordan made, like, this really good comparison in the group chat about how um, it almost feels like uh, Triple H felt when he got desperate about the World Heavyweight title. Did you want to tell him about that? I can. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that first, but I also okay. have another point to make. Yeah. This storyline has elevated two belts. This belt and the tag team titles. But I'm Ooh, going to start about with... That. 
Oh, I'm gonna start sorry. with the world title. I'm gonna you good. I'm gonna start with the, <laughs> the with Roman's belt though. Yeah, the way that Roman is, I feel like either has been desperate to keep that championship or will continue to exemplify his desperation to keep that championship is very, very similar to Triple H and Evolution back in 2003, 2004. Because he became Triple H when he held that world heavyweight title was synonymous with that world heavyweight title to the point where he looked out of place when he didn't have it. And to the point where he would do anything to keep it. And literally to the point where anytime he did not have the belt, he would do anything to get it back. That reminds me of what Roman Reigns is doing now with all like from the Usos interfering to solo debuting at Clash at the Castle to solo and the Usos teaming to get rid of Cody at Mania and secure the victory for Roman. Like, it's just that desperation that makes the belt so important because it's like, why is this person acting so desperate? It's because he wants to keep the belt this bad because the belt means so much. That's the first point. The second point is about the tag team championships. When was the last time a tag team championship match main evented WrestleMania? Remember, Charlotte and Rhea were slated to be the main event of, of WrestleMania night one. Because that that they won the Women's Rumble. There's two nights of Mania. They were going to main event one. Roman and Cody were going to main event the other. But the fans, because of this story, because of Sami Zayn and because of, you know, KO being tied to it, the fans demanded that a tag team championship match main event WrestleMania, which has never been done before. The last time I went to a WrestleMania, WrestleMania 35, and they mm -hmm. had the Raw tag team titles on the line, it was the second or third match of the pre-show. We weren't even thinking about tag team championships even being important enough to main event WrestleMania. No. And yet here we are with a tag team title match main eventing WrestleMania, and then Roman and Solo challenging again for the titles, right, at the, at the last premium live event. So what this tells me is just that they've... You know, and, and on top of that, you had like, oh, Jay is trying to contend for the U.S. title and Solo has held the North American title. So this bloodline storyline, while Roman Reigns is giving value to the WWE Undisputed Universal Championship, the bloodline as a storyline is giving value to the tag team championships and to the U.S. championship. But yeah, that was literally like my my little only man. Y'all need to start guy. thanking Triple H because I know we was like we was on this man's ass about him not doing enough and, you know, sabotaging these people that and putting over his indie darlings this. But, like, Vince couldn't do that. Vince did not give a crap about these tag team belts, and he really elevated every piece of gold that's been on the brand in the last couple months. Like, it, it was, a, it was a, a very slow, long brew, but, like, look where we're at now. Right. It's really, it's really crazy. Well, let's wrap this this topic up. I was about to say, that's say insane, about but yeah, let's <laughs> let's wrap it up. If y'all um, agree, disagree with us, if you, you want to chime in about this bloodline storyline, leave some comments below. But we're gonna move on. So it was reported that Gabe Stevenson, who has signed an LI NIL deal with WWE, he intends to use his final year of NCAA eligibility. So this would, I think, make him unable to compete in WWE. Do you believe that he made the right decision? Uh, he's not missing anything if he if he left. Not to say nothing's happening in wrestling. It's just that, I mean, he would still have to go through the PC Center. Then they would have to introduce him on their time. And, you know, um, we got enough going on that there's no, like, room for him to be shown by face so i feel like it was strategic because if he's paying attention to the product he knows he has a lot of time to buy and it's only a year a year's gonna fly by pretty fast but i feel like anyone that goes to the wwe now especially like in 2023 um i feel like anyone that goes into the wwe should always have a backup plan because you never know what's gonna happen with this company i mean we didn't even predict like last year that we would see the end of Vince McMahon being like, you know, hands on with this mm -hmm. business and all that flipped upside down. And the faces that we see now, we would never have predicted this time last year. So I think anyone that ever gets signed to the WWE um, needs to like keep 
keep their roots close to them. Like, of course, like fight for their dream and try to like get your foot into the door, whether it is WWE or AEW. But I feel like it's smart in wrestling to always have your backup. So he should finish off that. He definitely should get a degree. I endorse a lot of people getting degrees. Um, if you're going to be in WWE or if not a degree, go get a certificate or a license and something, something, bro, because you never know what his goddamn company. That being said, I think it's smart. He made the good, he made a good decision. And either way, because of his resume, like he's in a different position than other people stepping in. Like he's going to be utilized. Like Triple H <laughs> love. Yeah. No, I'm just saying like, I know Triple H is going to love him. Like he's, and Shawn Michaels is going to love him. He's going to be used straight out the gate, but his time will come. He has a lot of time to buy. Let him do his little thing, and he'll show when he shows up, and it's probably going to be good. What do you think? I agree. I think that him using his final year of eligibility uh, in Minnesota, you know, I think that it's the right thing to do for him. You know, obviously, it, I think this is his fourth and final year, so he will be graduating this year. Get that degree, bro. Get that degree. Go for go for it all, and I I went like you said. I don't think that he's really missing anything. In fact, I feel like the fact that he's staying a year behind to get his degree, I think it's preserving him. Right? It, there's no doubt about it that regardless of what happens with him personally, that Roman Reigns, the bloodline, that's the story of the year. You don't want him to throw him into WWE during the midst of that, and you want to help develop him, and because he has the potential to be a generational talent, he obviously. He's from Minnesota, like, goes to Minnesota. He has that amateur background. Like, do we have to, like, angle Shelton Benjamin, Charlie Haas, Brock Lesnar? These are all guys that kind of laid the blueprint for who Gabe Stevenson is probably going to step into. He's going to be great. And I feel like that greatness isn't, isn't going to be determined on what time he gets into the WWE, but just what happens when he gets there. And so I feel like, but as of right now, he should definitely just focus on the degree you know, maximize what he has while he has it and, you know, just kind of go from there. So Gabe, shout outs to you, bro, for getting that, for getting that degree, using that final year of NCAA eligibility. I feel like he's probably going to get another national championship as well. So we'll see with that, but we want to know how you guys feel about Gabe Stevenson using that last year of eligibility with the NCAA. Uh, but let us know in the comments below, but we're going to be moving on because things have been heating up with uh, WWE and MLW. And we're going to, I'm going to paraphrase and break it down in layman's terms. So a while ago, uh, MLW filed a lawsuit that stated that WWE had monopolized the market for the sale and licensing of media rights to pro wrestling events in the United States, uh, as reported by Fightful. Uh, in a new statement issued by the firm uh, that represents MLW, uh, WWE's motion to dismiss uh, MLW's amended suit has been denied, meaning that they can move forward with the claims. Um, and so as a result, MLW claims that they're going to proceed uh, with the lawsuit. So I just kind of wanted to know what your your opinion on this was and how significant and important this is. I just find it funny that it's becoming an annual thing that this company keeps getting sued. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Honestly, okay, can you just, like, explain a little further about, like, the sales and licensing of the media rights? Like, what, are they, are they talking about, like, certain pay-per-views, certain matches, certain people? Like, what exactly are they licensing or fighting over with the licensing? So, the issue at hand, and I'm going to pull it up because I feel like it needs to be explained a little bit more thoroughly right mm -hmm. now, and I'll break this I'll break this down. So essentially, there was an incident a while ago uh, where WWE, or me, W, well, that WWE had allegedly kind of interfered um, with the possibility of a potential media rights situation for MLW, right? Um, there was a possibility that MLW was going to get a new deal at a specific media outlet or a specific media platform. Allegedly, WWE interfered in that, telling that said platform that if they wanted, that if they wanted to, um, whatchamacallit, that if they wanted to move forward with the deal with MLW, that they can no longer do business with WWE. So that is one of the premises of this lawsuit. Ooh, now, as it pertains to the, the language surrounding this and kind of what's going on, right, 
when it comes to media rights, that is kind of the bread and butter of modern media for professional wrestling. That's where the majority of the money is coming from. Like when we talk about a company being a billion dollar company, one of the things that factors into that valuation of being a billion dollar company is the worth of these media rights contracts that they negotiate with certain cable, not cable providers, but certain entertainment companies like WWE, NBC, Universal, WWE, and Fox, right? So media rights is kind of the bread and butter. And essentially what this lawsuit is kind of insinuating is that WWE has, first of all, monopolized wrestling in the sense that they've bought up so many wrestling companies and so many, you know, wrestling properties and that they kind of get in the way of other companies from kind of coming in and kind of getting their fair share and getting their own media rights deals because they've acquired so many properties on this side, but they're also kind of potentially interfering in any potential deals with certain media companies and certain wrestling promotions. Does that make sense? No, it does make sense. It's just, it doesn't shock me because it's WWE and like they're kind of viewed at being at the top of the food chain. So I don't think like they ever thought that anyone's going to actually attempt to sue them for something Mm. like this. I'm not really sure how big MLW is in comparison to other wrestling companies or the other major ones. But Mm. um, yeah, I just kind of think that... um, it's a little bit surprising, I guess, for me that they even have like the ability to sue them back for something like this. Just mm. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't really have like that much feedback on it. <laughs> <laughs> it is okay because you know who does have feedback on it? Me. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you a little bit of my take. I'll give you a little bit of my take on it. Um, when it comes down to the media rights situation, when it comes down to the um. Just the whole notion of monopolizing, I think that that's a very, very heavy term. And WWE, while have they, they have provided us with great content and great media and great wrestling over the past God knows how many years, you buy up ECW, you buy up WCW. When Vince McMahon was kind of just starting, they bought up all the local territories. Um, you know, even now with kind of recently... You know, they've had business dealings with Evolve, business dealings with Progress. I don't know if they, I don't think that they bought out Progress. I think that they bought out Evolve. But Mm. when you accumulate that much IP, you can make the argument that you are now a monopoly because you've acquired things that were either once a company or were active companies prior to the acquisition. And you've kind of consolidated them. Now, in the context of American media, politics, entertainment, business, the whole idea, the whole idea of shaming a monopoly is that you eliminate the possibility of competition because of the lack of options, right? So if I'm WWE and I buy up all these companies, there's less companies competing with WWE. Therefore, there's less money going into the industry because there are less competitors. People respond better to competition than they do a singular experience, which is the reason why anytime WWE and another wrestling company go at it, it's a wrestling boom period. You look at WWE and WCW. We look at now WWE and AEW, right? They're usually when they're competing brands, we have a sense of excitement surrounding an industry because of the competition. So I think that, That's just something to keep in mind. Um, If this lawsuit kind of goes through and MLW wins, I think it's a game changer. But it also just kind of depends on how much WWE has to give up. Because at this point, now WWE is is owned by Endeavor. So it's like, how much is Endeavor willing to give up? And is it going to be really that much of a loss for them, considering that they're a a multi-billion dollar company? And now they're kind of under a bigger parent company who has the financial fortitude to kind of sustain them even during the midst of a lawsuit that would technically break down any normal company, if that makes sense. So that's just my little take on it, but we want to know how you guys feel about this MLW WWE thing. Is WWE a monopoly? Is it not? Let us know in the comments below. And moving on to a more recent topic. So last night, 
it was reported that NXT recorded its highest viewership in nearly two years, and it ranked as the number two show on cable. So, Mo, I want to know what your take is on this. What, what, like, how how did they be? How did they evolve into this position? Um, how did they get to this spot? Um, I'll be honest, because like it's interesting. It's very interesting development because I feel like WWE has attempted many a times to try to circulate NXT a little bit more by trying to bring out their biggest current stars back to the um um uh, back to NXT just to like do some double exposure and i felt like in the past it either barely tweaked the numbers or just people just didn't really care and i know for at least the last 2 years it's been it's been quite the evolution dealing with NXT um some people are still still have a bad taste in their mouth that is not 1.0 and they don't like the transition to the way uh 2.0 was but i feel like they kind of found like their sweet spot with this brand and it's kind of reflecting in like the numbers and the viewership um it doesn't to me feel so much like a like a developmental brand even though that it is and i feel like you do have to thank people like Seth that came in and bought the numbers actually up because I mean, Seth, Seth is just really that guy. He's very over. He may not be um, part of this like bloodline storyline that's going on, but like he's very much over in his own way. Um, and I feel like you do have to like thank him specifically, although we did have other pop-ups. We did have other Absolutely. pop-ups um, with, with main roster people last week but i feel like you specifically really have to thank seth because if it weren't for him and also actually i want to give at least like credit to the last pay-per-view that nxt had i do feel like because AEW kind of tanked it and then people kind of ended up watching um nxt it did bring more attention to nxt Absolutely. but i but i do feel like you have to handshake Rollins for this one just because like I don't, I think he's the whole reason why people actually wanted to tune in, and it was a damn good match between him and Braun Breaker, by the way. And not that I expected any less from the both of them, but it was, it just made me excited for whenever Braun Breaker actually does come back up to uh, the main roster and tries to attempt to get his lick back, which kind of just goes to show you again from our um, previous topics how important the um, the new belts all fill. Yes. Because people tuned in not only just for Seth, but because also, again, like, oh, that belt's actually hopping over to NXT. Like, I love that that's how they're using the belts. Like, the belt's not just staying on its its particular brand, but they're giving it the exposure that it, it deserves by um, cross-promoting and going over to NXT and showcasing talent. Um, and I think Seth is the perfect person to use. Who else did they bring down? Uh, Baron Corbin also came down. Like they're basically giving like shine to people that held goal once upon a time, um, which I love that. That's very much a triple Triple H thing to do. Um, they kind of did that with um, when they brought in like the NXT UK people, and they were trying to make mm-hmm. them mirror the people who are currently in um, NXT or were on the main roster who previously held NXT goal. So I kind of like that connection right there. I feel like, like I said, it doesn't feel like it's a developmental brand. And I think that's, it's huge for, for NXT that they're now not feeling like they're like the weak link. Like of course, yes, in terms of viewership, they're still going to be number three, but now I feel like they could be possible competition to what they got going on with AEW. Hmm. And I feel like they should have been competition because not for nothing, they have a stack roster over there. The storylines actually aren't bad. Everything feels less, um, less, less e-ish, I, sh- I should say. I feel like um, they went through this weird phase with 2.0 NXT back when it was colorful where they were doing a little bit too much to try to be entertaining-ish. But now it feels a little bit more serious. But, you know, they, they found the sweet spots with all their main characters that they got going on here to where all the storylines feel like it's something you want to get invested in. It's something that could be taken seriously. So, honestly, yeah, 
I love what they have going on. Shout out to Seth for giving us the viewership. It was a damn good um, show for NXT. And I'm interested to see moving forward how they plan on using, you know, the main roster people and the belts over there. And speaking of which, we didn't even mention, but Dana Brooke even um, had an appearance. She had an appearance. And she, I think, did she fake her injury on TV? I I know we're getting a whole topic. Okay, because she finished through the match or whatnot. I just want to say, I've been bagging on Dana Brooke, and I just want to actually, like, give her credit where it's due because that match between Cora Jade was actually very good, which goes to show you how good Cora Jade is with how young she is. Oh, my God. That match was actually pretty good, and I actually felt bad when I saw some articles come out about how people were just ragging on Dana because I was one of them for the longest. I'm not going to hold you. But she did really well. She did really, really well. Um, but it's like stuff like that. This that that's goes to show you how legitimate that brand kind of already is. Like, mm. damn, they were sh- they were cheering Cora and booing Dana Brooke, and Dana Brooke was actually holding her own and doing a pretty goddamn good job. Like, mm-hmm. they could compete. They really could like hold their own against main roster people. That it's mm-hmm. kind of insane to me. But how did you feel about this this ranking with NXT and Seth Rollins' oh. appearance? So I I have to start with this, right? NXT is kind of, this new version of NXT is a combination of NXT 1.0 and 2.0, in my opinion. It takes kind of the positive things of both eras and kind of brings them all together. I do believe that Seth Rollins was definitely one of the reasons as to why the viewership was so high. And we have to also give credit to Seth Rollins as far as his World Heavyweight Championship reign, because usually... When we deal with babyface champions, it's always the same problem, which is that the reigns are boring. And he's finding ways to make it interesting as a babyface, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to NXT, you know what I mean? And and, and, you know what I mean? And with his presence came Finn Balor, another former NXT champion, right? (laughs) And that only did, and that that only reaped, you know, benefits for NXT and their viewership. So... That was a that was a bright spot, and I feel like him bringing the belt adds interest and nuance to a championship reign that a lot of people thought it was going to be boring. So I think we got to give him credit for that. I think that that match was a banger. I think that they did their thing. I feel like Seth was a big reason, but also kind of NXT is also kind of building off of its previous momentum and just reaping the benefits on being on a night of television where there aren't where there isn't another wrestling show right like you were saying that they could compete with AEW and you know they probably can but at the same time it's like some people want to watch both a lot of people want to watch both and I feel like the ratings were higher now because it's like I don't have to decide between AEW and NXT I can just watch both I could just watch both one comes on Tuesday the other one comes on Wednesday and so there's that aspect Not and I also everybody. Huh? It's enough wrestling for everybody. Exactly. And another thing, what I love about the this kind of modern era of NXT, one of the things that they used to do in NXT 1.0 that they're doing now is that they're bringing credible main roster talent down, and it's a win-win because it gives that main roster talent a fresh start, and it also puts the NXT guys up against established talent, and it only does well for them, right? Baron Corbin... Is, is down there. Mustafa Ali is also down there. And his feud, for, and, you know, him being involved in the North American Championship picture, it's only helping, you know, everyone. You know what I mean? It's helping the talent that's going down there, and then it's also helping the talent that they're going up against. So I think that all around, while the viewership is because of Seth Rollins, I also believe that NXT is on to something special with how they've been progressing and how they've been just kind of moving along. So... Kudos to NXT. Was there anything that you wanted to say? No, I feel like kind of talk my behind off about NXT because I like it so much lately. <laughs> cool. Well, um, Jesus. Cool. Well, that uh, is our NXT little spiel. Let us know how you feel about NXT in the comments below. But we're going to get on to the, the main event of the show. And that main event is the predictions for AEW's Forbidden Door pay-per-view alongside uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling emanating this Sunday 
from the Scotia Bank Arena in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This match card looks like something straight out of a video game. It's just dream match after dream match after dream match after dream match. We're not going to get – we're not going to waste any more time, though, because we're going to start from the bottom of the card. So first thing that we have is Chris Jericho, Minoru Suzuki, and Sammy Guevara going up against Sting, Darby Ooh. Allen, and a partner of Sting and Darby's choice. Who do you have? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, Suzuki gonna clap the fuck out of whoever is is to be announced. (laughs) Oh my god! Just because he's on the list, I kind of want to say whatever side Suzuki's on. So I want to give that to him and Sammy. So Mm. that's a dangerous man. But I, I, I I like Darby and Sting. I really do. I just don't feel like they ever put Darby any anywhere where he's going to really get over I, I don't know i feel like he's kind of just floating around until they give him this time i feel like they're working on sammy still mm. so i'm gonna give it to suzuki and sammy as well as Kacher- i actually i sorry i just got super distracted by something i actually believe the contrary i think that sting and darby are gonna win because if you notice AEW's programming they've kind of been showing that there's been this growing lack of ten, la, well, not lack of tension. There's been this growing tension between Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara. Um, even down to like the little match they had this past week, Chris did the pose with somebody else that he normally does with Sammy. And I think that we're going to get a Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara feud. So because of that, I think they're going to continue to capitalize off of this and Sting and Darby's team is going to win. Moving on, though, we have Konosuke Takeshka, Shota, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, and the Blackpool Combat Club versus <laughs> Eddie Kingston, Tomo, Tomohiro Ishii, and the Elite. Who do you have? I'm on whatever side Eddie Kingston's on at all times. <laughs> I am so biased when it comes to Eddie Kingston because I love that man so much. But... Yeah, yeah. No, that's my pick. That's my pick. I fucking love Eddie. <laughs> I can't wait to see him be reckless in the ring. Go on. I got Eddie Kingston, Ishii, and the Elite. Um, I definitely feel like they're going to w- get the win. I think it's going to be a very, very big match, a very, very good match. Uh, so I'm going to go with Eddie Kingston, Ishii, and the Elite. The next match is going to be the AEW World Women's Champion, Tony Storm versus Willow Nightingale, uh, who is the New Japan Strong Women's Champion. This match will be for the AEW Women's World Championship. Who do you have? Mm, I feel like, okay, so the way my brain is wired, I'm also, for some reason, keep factoring Mercedes into here, and I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. But, like, part of me is wondering, oh, I wonder if she would, like, show face at all. Mm. You know, because yeah. technically this was built around her showing face, hence, like, Forbidden Door. So I would, like, I'm wondering, all right, well, if she were to hypothetically show up or come back for this belt now, I don't think I would see her trying to take back an AEW belt as well from Willow. I see her just trying to take back the original belt that she went for. So because I'm thinking ahead, I'm going to say Tony. Although I would love, in theory, for Will to go over just because I really adore Willow. She's so likable, bro. She's so She likeable. is like the perfect baby face that they could use for that company. Just She's doing so good. And this match is going to be a banger. But I'm going to have to go with Tony for just logical reasons. I agree. I'm going to go with Tony. I think that had this been, you know, Mercedes was in this spot, I think this would be a very, very different match and a very, very different result. But I do think that Tony Storm is going to win this match and retain her championship. Next, mm-hmm. we have a four-way for the AEW International Championship. This is going to be a banger. Uh, we have uh, Orange Cassidy versus Daniel Garcia versus Zack Sabre Jr. Ooh. versus Shibata. Who we got? Oh, my God. This is like a wet dream. 
<laughs> no, I love Zack Sabre Jr., but, like, this is going to be a banger. This is going to be a banger. Um, do I see Orange Cassidy retaining? I feel like, for some reason, Orange Cassidy would retain, but in my heart, I would love Zack Sabre Jr. to go over. <laughs> Just because I love that man. He's, he's one of my faves. Who do you think? Funny part is, I would love to see Zack Sabre Jr. win as well, but I feel like everybody's going to look over Daniel Garcia, and I think he's going to win the match. Mm. I, can see, I don't think that we've had a Daniel Garcia AEW championship reign. There was a point in time where he held the pure championship and carried it in AEW. I feel like Chris Jericho and Sammy are moving towards a feud in which Sammy is going to be completely out of the Jericho Appreciation Society. Therefore, Daniel Garcia is going to be the new number two option as a solo wrestler. I feel like he's going to be what Randy Orton was in evolution. And I feel like if you mm. want to put him on that path, give him some gold. So I think Daniel Garcia is going to be the new AEW international champion. And then we have a Owen Hart first round cup match uh, between CM Punk and Kojima. Uh, apparently, allegedly, CM Punk and Kenta were supposed to be a thing. We don't know if that's true. It was just rumors and reports. But who do you have winning this match? Hmm, that's very interesting. Just because um, they recently on AEW also plugged in. Um, wait, no, I'm thinking about the wrong thing. I'm thinking about the wrong thing. Scratch that. Just delete that completely. But um, no, CM Punk versus Satoshi. Hmm. Do I see him winning? Isn't he involved in a whole other feud as well? Who? Isn't CM Punk also involved in a whole other feud as well? I mean, the Bullet Club Gold thing um, hmm. has been active, but, it, it you know, we don't know where that's at. I mean, if you want to keep, keep establishing Punk, it would make sense that he went over. But does he also need to win this? I don't think so. I feel like he'd probably win this one, but he wouldn't go far and completely win. I feel like someone's going to take him out. I don't see him actually winning um, the whole Owen Hart Cup. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with him for now. I'm going to go with him for now. But he's not going to last in this tournament. No offense. I feel that. So what I was going to say, I'd have Punk winning this match. I also have Punk winning this tournament. Because when really? I look at the bracket... When I look at the bracket, I'm like, Punk is the biggest star. You want to establish him on a new show. He doesn't hold a belt, or at least not explicitly. He's going to be walking around with that red dag all the time. But um, hmm. I I think that because if you want to establish, if you want to reestablish CM Punk as the face of a show, he needs to win this match, and I feel like he needs to win the tournament overall. So I think that Punk is going to win the match and the tournament as well. I thought like the tournament moving... should be like used to like bring out another star that doesn't really get enough shine. Like I feel like that's what the point of tournaments are, not to give someone establishment that is already like, you know. True, true but you ha I feel like in this particular case, this is the Owen Hart tournament, the Memorial Tournament, and last year they used it to kind of obviously pay homage to Owen Hart. Um, they did the men's and the women's. Britt Baker won the women's one. Adam Cole won the men's one. Which was one. so wasted to me. Because I'm like, tournaments are meant to show off new talent or Very talent true. that you weren't paying attention to and establish them because Britt was already established. Adam Cole was pretty much established. I think they got a little bit of flack for that. Because it's just like, go ahead. But I said I, they did. But I just think that because of the way that it was last year, I think they're going to follow a certain formula. And I think that uh, Punk is going to win it this year. Uh, we Just can bet based on that off the one. Patterns. What do y'all think? I want to hear what y'all think about that one. Yeah. We can bet on it. Put them, put them comments below and let us know. But um, the next, ooh, now we have the world championship matches and the main event. So we have MJF versus Hiroshi Tanahashi for the ooh. AEW World Championship. Who do you have? Because this is going to be a banger. Uh, I feel like I feel like he has to retain. I feel like MJF has to retain but i don't think he's going to retain cleanly i feel like he's going to do some dickhead dickheadish thing where he's probably going to cheat or do something with the referees not look not looking which is still cheating um i see this being a dirty victory 
by MJF. A dirty thing. Because it, ha- it has I, to I circle agree. back to uh, Adam His Cole character. and MJF. It has to. Absolutely. Like, they're going to fight for the belt yet again. So this is just a buy time. Like, it's going to be a I damn agree. good match, but it's going to be, like, a, a very much a dirty victory. Absolutely. I agree. For with the fact that it has to be a dirty victory because I feel like it has to be in alignment with who his character is. And I feel like it's very of him to have a dirty victory. And he's been talking like a bunch of crap about New Japan. So I feel like this is just kind of the natural way to win. Well, he's going to do something so racist in the ring. I could see it. I could see it. Oh, <laughs> I could see the taunting oh. that he's going to do. Oh, this is going to be messy. This is going to be I- messy as, as all <laughs> For the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship, we have Sonata versus Jungle Boy. I have Sonata. I think Sonata is going to retain. Um, I have Sonata as well. I don't. Yeah, I don't really. I don't see Jungle Boy going over there and being steady in Japan. I I, I can't visually see it. Yeah. I don't think they. I know it sounds rude, but I feel like they wouldn't even want to. If they had the option to, I don't think they they would be reaching out to Jungle Boy. I mean, he's. My bad. Keep going. Keep going. No, no, no. Actually, you could go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like Jungle Boy is close to being a world champion. I feel like he just needs a little bit more development. But I can see him. I can see a world where they they put the belt on him. But I just think that Sonata's yeah. gonna retain because he it's Sonata. I just, I like Jungle Boy, but I can't see him anywhere but AEW. Like, I feel like just. Off of his look, he's not a, he's not going to be appealing to everybody. Like I feel like you have to be like larger than life in order to be desired over in New Japan. And Jungle Boy doesn't give me larger than life. He gives me like in the works. Maybe like with age and some tenure, like he he could like establish himself. But like right now, I think he he's there, but he's not like even top ten for me. But he's mm. he's there. He's doing a great job. Just. Great match. I'm still gonna give it to Sonata. I I just can't see it for any reasoning going to Jungle Boy. Hmm. But moving on. Moving on. So we're going from that into the IWGP. This is the match I'm looking forward to the most. The IWGP <laughs> United States Championship match between Kenny Omega and Will Ospreay. I actually have Will Ospreay winning this. I'm going to go Will. Was, go ahead, go ahead. My bad. Sorry. If Kenny went to the Tokyo Dome and got one on Will, I feel like this is Will oh, coming yeah. back to get one on him. That's my reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's going to be as stiff as before, too. This match might be. I'm not sure if they still hate each other or not. <laughs> it's gonna, it is, it is going to be a little um, stiff, though. I know but it must have fact. hurt Will's ego just a little bit to... Mm-hmm have lost to Kenny back then. So I am imagining a stiff match, but like you said, I guess the 50-50 booking with Will going over. But very excited to see this one because they definitely gave us a whole lot in Japan. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that for sure. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. I think it's just going to also just be a banger. But in the main event... I was like trying to scroll. My phone got frozen. That's why I was. Yeah, like, I had to copy and paste my shit because I kept glitching and bringing it back. But go on, but go on. The last match of the night: Kazuchika Okada versus Brian Danielson. Oh my god, <laughs> this is going to be insane. I popped so hard when he popped up on AEW yesterday. Just ah, this is gonna hit. This is gonna hit. It's gonna hit in all the right ways. Um. I'm happy for Brian for having this opportunity too though just because I feel like people said that he's wasted and it's just like but he's versing Okada mm, absolutely. the man that every promotion is trying to get their grubby hands on he's got Okada like I don't think that's someone that's wasted to me at all this man gets to be in the best matches and I don't know. I'm just really excited for this. Um, I don't think Okada likes losing, as far as I know. I feel like he's a little, you know, he's he's a little privileged sometimes. Mm. So I feel like I can't necessarily see him losing. I feel like it might go to Okada because right now it's not that big of a deal if Ryan loses. Because, like I said previous times, it's kind of a 
established that Brian is Daniel Bryan. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like he, I'm not saying he should lose forever, but I'm saying he's the type of guy where, like, he's so good and we all know that he's actually good. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like his purpose in AEW is to either, if not elevate mm-hmm. talent, is to just put on dream matches. So he could afford a loss because the match is going to be so good that I promise you everyone's going to give stand up and give this a standing ovation. I agree with the standing ovation. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just got super sidetracked. I think it's, it's okay. going to get I think it's going to get a standing ovation and you were saying Okada isn't used to taking L's. He's going to take this L though. And I think that Brian really? Danielson is going to win this match. Here is my reasoning. Thank God I pulled up my notes. Here's my reasoning. I believe that the Blackpool Combat Club is is a very, very interesting faction in the sense that the leader or the alleged or one of the co-leaders does not consistently wrestle. He's kind of Brian Danielson hasn't had a match in 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 a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's intentional because I believe that he is one of those guys that whenever he puts on his boots, it's a special occasion. And so I think that they want to continue that. And I believe that if you want to continue to kind of reinforce this idea that the Blackpool Combat Club is a group of the best wrestlers in the world, you need to have your leader beat the best wrestler in the world. That best wrestler in the world, I think, there are five people right now who you can consider the best wrestler in the world. I think Roman Reigns is one of them. Seth Rollins is another. John Moxley in the world. Is, in the world, I think there's five. People Roman Reigns is in the world. In the world, I feel. I said you can make the case for five. You can make the case for Roman. You can make the case for Seth. You can hmm. make the case for Kenny. You can make the case for Okada. And you can make the case for Danielson. I believe that Danielson should beat Okada. Because it's a way to keep him important. It's a way to reinforce the dominance of the Blackpool Combat Club where Brian Danielson doesn't have to hold a title for him to be considered that guy. But that's and, New Japan's baby. <laughs> like I don't feel like they're going to do that to him. But very true. But that also sets up a Wrestle Kingdom rematch. So you think it's going to be a clean, a clean W? I don't think it's going to be a clean W. I think that there's going to be some mischief involved. Maybe some chaos members get involved. Maybe some Blackpool Combat Club members get involved. But I think that it's going to be a W for Brian Danielson. It's going to set up the world. It's going to set up a, 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 a possibility of a Wrestle Kingdom rematch. Because, yes, yeah. that is Okada. Okada is New Japan's baby. However, just a loss doesn't necessarily mean that you look weak. And a rematch doesn't necessarily devalue the match. Look at what we're seeing with Will Ospreay versus Kenny Omega. That's right? different. That's Will Ospreay. This is literally Okada, like the John Cena of <laughs> New yeah, Japan. Like, I just don't see it. <laughs> like, I really don't. We could bet on this one, too. I, I, I'll bet 99 cents. But I, <laughs> I'll bet a strong dollar. But, yeah, I think, that, dollar. I, I, think <laughs> Daniel, I think Danielson is going to win this one. I really, really do. And I think that that's going to set up a Wrestle Kingdom rematch. But that's, that's just my little opinion. Um, but yeah, let us know what y'all feel about Forbidden Door in the comments below. Um, and those are our predictions. So thank you guys so much for tuning in for this episode of Culture 316. Be sure to join us on our space 15 minutes before the show starts on our Twitter called at Culture 316. We can't wait to see you guys there. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And we're going to see you guys either this Sunday or next week. Show me where it's at.